Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Sharon Celine. Welcome to our Friday Facebook Live webinars. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and uh, it's particularly exciting because I haven't been here for a while and um, very much looking forward to our topic today, which is about ADHD in the workplace um, and how to uh, talk about it. So I'm hoping that you'll join in. You'll let me know where you're from and say hello. Um, I'm currently looking for the downloadable document that I just did, <laughs> uh, which I've just found, which is exciting uh, to kind of help me, guide me through today. So welcome. Um, you know, say hello in the chat and let me know where you're from. And we'll, uh, we'll get started in a minute or two when we have a, a real quorum of folks. Um, it's great to be here. I've been traveling quite a bit in the last few weeks, giving presentations on emerging adulthood with ADHD and social anxiety for elementary school students and high school and middle school students. So I'm very happy to be home. Uh, the sun is out, my tulips are blooming. It seems great. So say hello and tell me where you're from. I don't see any of your comments yet, but um, I'd love to, to uh, greet you and, um, and know where you're from. Hi, Angelica, thank you. You are my first hello from uh, Brooklyn, Ohio, suburbs of Cleveland. Great, Enchanted Garden Day in Nursery in Nottinghamshire in the UK. Uh, we have uh, Lauren from Southern California and Monique from Texas, Catherine from Ireland, welcome. Um, it's great to have all of you today. And we're talking about such an important topic here, which is about living as a neurodivergent person in the workplace. And what are some of the questions or strengths, um, well, questions that you have and how can you apply your strengths to, um, to your job. So we have Mena from Egypt, we have Mal from Australia, Erica from Missouri, Letta from Tulsa, Jane from the UK, and Andrea from Sheffield, Full Monty Town. All right, fantastic. So let's get started. Um, what I'd like to start with is a question, and I'll put this uh, comment in the chat, which is how many of you have disclosed at work that you have ADHD? Um, and if you could share a little bit about why and what that was like for you. Oops. Okay. So how many of you have disclosed at work that you have ADHD? And uh, Victoria from England, hello. Now let's see. Angelica says, I don't work. Uh, but I have a disability, and I have a hard time concentrating on day-to-day -day tasks, uh, but I help the Lord, and I'm trying. Good for you. Um, so, Kelly, thank you. Hello. Helena from Saskatchewan, welcome. Um, thank you, Attitude. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Victoria, I had to go to self-employment okay I have um, I uh, a couple of other people also don't work but have a hard time focusing we'll be talking about that later um, uh, let's see uh, um, America you've disclosed um, Kelly you're newly diagnosed Matthew my organization is very aware of my diagnosis Sean diagnosed two years ago, current job in hospitality, have spoken openly about it, triggers, overstimulation, etc. feel brushed off. Mm, sorry to hear that. Um, let's see, uh, Kate, I have because I arranged some support through Access to Work, which is an organization in the UK who provided me with some workplace coaching. Um, Catherine, ADHD and ASD, I'm lucky to be in a very supportive work environment, however this is new ground, there is a lack of guidance for workplaces, this is true. Uh, Andrea, disclose because I can't keep anything to myself and I wanted to see if, they, if there was any help I could get via our amazing occupational health. Did you get that help? Uh, Enchanted Garden, uh, I shared with my team that I have ADHD as there are people on my team that I feel have ADHD, okay. 
Matthew says, I'm fortunate my coworkers are very supportive. Lila says, I didn't disclose as there were no laws where I live that say I should get any special treatment or support. Uh, Monique says, you were diagnosed nine years ago. Kate, unfortunately, performance has been managed due to struggling focus and making mistakes. So you're being evaluated even though you're struggling. Um, Kelly says, you're at a fourth employment agency. And Kayla says, I've gotten help. Well, thank you all very much. So I think the first thing that we want to talk about here today is myth busting, because a lot of people may work at places where um, the message that they're getting is that their ADHD is not real. I'm curious if any one of you have gotten um, a, a message like that from uh, somebody at your job who's basically said to you, well, ADHD isn't a real thing. Um, we know that ADHD is a real thing, um, and you know uh, its its percentages among adults vary depending where uh, we're talking about. But it's somewhere between four and six or seven percent of adults who have ADHD, and adults with ADHD is the fastest growing population. Um, Lisa says I have ADHD and have been diagnosed. I also have had childhood trauma. How do I know if my struggle with memory? is of the suppressed trauma or the ADHD. Um, it might be a little bit of both, actually, Lisa, because tr um, trauma and suppressed trauma impact the same areas of our, uh, similar areas of our brain as ADHD um, and other ones, of course. Claire says, not diagnosed, but fairly, fairly sure this is me and just trying to navigate with interest as I struggle at work and always have. Mm. Erica says, yes, Louise O'Brien, very so much, very much so. My ex-boss thought I was making my struggles up. I keep losing work due to anxiety. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the facts that we can share with our, um, our professional colleagues about ADHD. So there's the one that I just told you about how uh, the percentage of ADHD in the adult population. And then there are some other statistics that I think are really important for you to know. One is that anxiety co-occurs with ADHD about 50% of the time. So 50% of adults with ADHD have been found to have anxiety and anxiety disorder, a full diagnosis, of course, that means that doesn't really count for those of those people who have anxiety but don't have an anxiety disorder, um, and and those numbers are fairly high. Uh, depression, somewhere between 20 and 50 percent. Uh, bipolar disorder, a wide range, somewhere between five and 47 percent. Eating disorders, uh, women with, with ADHD are three times as likely uh, to have an eating disorder. There's a much higher risk for it. A learning disabilities at 50%, substance abuse disorders 25 to 45%, and autism spectrum disorders you really carry over from childhood at around 14% as a secondary diagnosis. In addition, families living with ADHD, and if you're a parent with ADHD, uh, you, you know, what we see is increased parent-child conflict, um, that the, your mental health affects your child's level of stress, and their mental health affects your level of stress. Um, we know that adolescence is a risky critical period that can affect lifelong functioning and adolescence and ADHD is a super complicated time. People are always asking me, you know, what is ADHD and what part is is adolescence? And the answer really is yes, you know, they're intertwined. They they're, they're dependent on each other. Kids are aware of the struggles they have, but what they're not aware of and what we really don't need to tell them is that there are higher economic costs associated with raising a child with ADHD. Um, there are additional costs that include, you know, private tutoring, uh, perhaps summer classes, extra software, or learning services beyond those that are applied by the educational system. Also replacing lost belongings or school supplies, dismissal from extracurricular activities, 
or a loss of daycare that's already paid for by parents. And of course, there are sleep issues. So there are a lot of things that we know about ADHD. In addition, ADHD is not a recent invention. There are, um, there's documentation back to the 1700s, particularly in Europe, of, of people who had and displayed symptoms that were like ADHD, but not necessarily called ADHD. And, and it started uh, to have its own diagnostic category and, um, uh, you know, in, in the United States in the early 1900s. And it were in the 1930s, Dr. Charles Bradley found that stimulants could help his, student, his, his patients who had um, symptoms of ADHD. Um, so it's been around for quite a while. Let's look at some of these comments here. Um, Monique says, I have the same issue. There was a lot of fighting in the house until my mother left in 2014. Letta says, um, I, hell, I tell myself that on the regular. I know it is a real thing, but I was raised in a home where it didn't exist and I was just being weird. I'm sorry, Letta, I bet that was really hard for you. Jane, I haven't been diagnosed, but the more and more I look into it, I think I have it. Being prescribed medication for depression and anxiety since 19, and now I'm 47. Uh, Kelly uh, says, my brother and niece fight most of the time. Uh, both have mental health issues. And Lisa asks, could we discuss medication use that are new medications because my anxiety of my dis anxiety disorder, the ADHD medications seem to increase the anxiety, making the medication, taking the medication really hard. Yes, Lisa, we can absolutely discuss that. And I'm gonna do that right now before I go back to talking about um, ADHD at work. So there are different types of medications for ADHD. There are stimulants, um, and those can be, you know, Ritalin or what we, you know, basically the methylphenol Phenidate strain, and those could be Ritalin or Metadate or Concerta or Focalin. Uh, there's also um, the Adderall group of medications, which are Adderall, Adderall XR, and Vyvanse. And, and many people with ADHD report that those medications can activate their anxiety. Then there are non-stimulants, which could be things like um, Stratera or uh, Guanfacine or Intuiv or Wellbutrin, and those are um, non-stimulants, which act in a different way, uh, and they can be less um, uh, less sort of agitating and less um, activating for anxiety. So, um, it, you know, it's worth talking to your prescriber. Sometimes taking um, anti-anxiety uh, medication, like uh, the antidepressants, can actually help with some ADHD symptoms because we're not exactly sure how all those neurotransmitters work in the soup of our brains. Um, some people, you know, take Prozac and find that that helps them uh, with their concentration, which it's not really, you know, prescribed to do, but it lowers their anxiety, so maybe that's why they're able to attend better. Let's see a lot of com comments here. Uh, Angelica, I take clonidine, it really helps and is good for the heart. Clonidine, yes, I forgot to list that one, thank you. Tiffany, I currently work for a company that, and that is amazing and works with us so much. That's wonderful, what does your company do, Tiffany? Um, Catherine, I find it hard with the absence of professional guidance to be able to identify solutions myself in the workplace because I'm too close to my own profile. Of course, I just need the consistent feedback to prioritize. Yes, and you also need someone who's supervising you who can give you that consistent feedback with kindness and compassion rather than with negativity and judgment. Um, Kate, I take Concerta and I find that it really reduces my anxiety and calms me down. That happens for a lot of people with ADHD. When the ADHD is actually treated you know, effectively, anxiety reduces. Um, Kelly, no medications work for me. They don't work or they don't last. That can be frustrating. Um, uh, I didn't know that it had health benefits. Yes, clonidine and some of the other medications like guanfacine or Intuiv are um, blood pressure medications. Can be blood, I, I think so. I'm not a prescriber, so I really like to be very careful about what I say, but I believe that uh, clonidine is a blood pressure medication. Um, 
Tiffany says, well, Butrin was so bad for my anxiety, great for my ADHD, but bad for my anxiety. It is so tough sometimes to find medications that actually target what you need, and sometimes it requires taking more than one. Andrea says, my openness has made others feel more comfortable to discuss neurodiversity and see it in themselves and their loved ones. They don't feel scared to say, I think I may have to me because they know I will listen and not judge. That's very nice. That's so important. Tiffany, I work for Humana. Okay. Catherine, do you know if having a dual diagnosis makes it more challenging to identify solutions? I find my profile to ADHD exclusive and the meds you suggested weren't a solution. You know, I'm again, I'm not a prescriber and so I think, you know, when you have medication questions, you need to seek out an experienced, qualified prescriber. I'm just listing what I know, you know, what I've heard of and that's that's around and what I know people are prescribed. Uh, I think having a dual diagnosis can make it more challenging to not just uh, um, to identify and intervene with symptoms, but also to find solutions that work. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, federal regulations and federal regulatory anxiety uh, agencies um, that um, provide for equal access to work or education then in the United States that's called the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, and they ban practices that are discriminatory. So there, you know, the ADA is to protect you and to facilitate access and accommodation so you can attend school, so you can, uh, you know, attend and thrive at work. Uh, when when you know, one one of the things that I think is challenging is that despite workplace legal protections like the ADA, many people with ADHD report nervousness and 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 concern about revealing their diagnosis at work. Other people think they've you know made that leap to receive accommodations and address symptoms, uh, and it's been successful. Um, so I think it's really important to kind of suss out uh, your work situation and maybe to start by having a conversation with a colleague rather than a superior if you're nervous about letting people know. I also think that when you're open, um, people may come to you like they come to uh, the woman earlier uh, who are, uh, who, who, and say, oh, I have this too, you know, I need to, um, to take care of that. Um, one thing that I think is, can be helpful also is maybe to start like a neurodiversity interest group at your job so that you can meet for lunch once a month and talk about um, what it's like to live with neurodivergence um, and, and get the support you need. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about um, strategies. So we, we, you know, we know that with a hectic place of, pace of modern life, many adults find it hard to keep up, follow through, and get ahead in their work lives, whether they have ADHD or not. Um, uh, the to-do list gets longer, the phone buzzes constantly, and there are multiple things to juggle simultaneously. Uh, many people with ADHD struggle in the de with the demands of, of such a high intensity work environment because it's harder to keep focused, to manage competing priorities, and stay organized. But the way, it affect, the way ADHD affects work performance varies widely from person to person. So someone may wrestle with a messy desk, but show up to meetings early and, and be ready to go when they start. And someone else may, um, may arrive to appointments um, late and, and can't seem to stick with projects until completion. So let's look at some strategies that would help people in the workplace. So the first thing that we want to do is to minimize distractions. Um, so set up specific times to work uh, with timed intermittent break periods. Turn off your phone or use a do not disturb app setting during these work periods. Plan for specific times to check your phone during the day, say in the morning before getting started, at lunch, and maybe you know for a coffee break in the afternoon. Limiting access and the distraction of your phone will improve your focus and your sustained attention only if you turn off notifications for texts and other things 
on your, your computer. I recommend that you close all tabs that aren't related to your work and consider putting all those tabs that aren't related to your work on a different browser where it's actually harder to get to them and open them. Um, and so um, that will that you know, be, that will improve your efficiency uh, because when your field of vision is crowded with so many tabs, um, you, you're not really sure what exactly you're working on or where's that thing, and it feels kind of overwhelming. Um, we know that studies have proven that multitasking doesn't work. In fact, it makes you far less efficient using um, you know being able to clear out the, your visual field um, will, will, will help you, you know, um, feel more spacious and be able to persist on some of your goals. Think about what helps you concentrate. So let's put in the chat, what helps you concentrate? Do you need a quiet place to work? Do you need noise-canceling noise headphones? Do you like white noise or brown noise? Once you've clarified that, you can then start to set up an environment that works for you. So Kate says, oh, okay, Andrea says, we have an ND group at work. I met another ADHD woman for lunch, and it was hilarious how we just kept talking over each other and the constant Me Too responses. That's fantastic. That's just wonderful. Um, Kate, uh, we have one too, which I find very helpful. Fantastic. Um, Catherine, Microsoft Teams is such a terrible dopamine fix, constant notifications to react to instead of focusing on desk research. Exactly. And what we want to do is to focus on that desk research. Um, Tiffany says you're so glad you work from home. Background noise in the ba in the background noise is the best. So what kinds of things help you focus? Is it background noise? Is it a quiet space? Is it having a a, a, a work buddy, uh, a partner who's doing something on their w w next to you? So you're kind of encouraging each other. What helps you? Um, what helps you focus at, at doing your work? Um, Kate says, I have to set myself to do not to do a do not disturb on teams a lot. Great, um, because that's effective. You know what you need. Kayla, I work at home but get very distracted. What kinds of things distract you, Kayla? Kate, I can't have silence. I find music helpful. You know, I, um, I, I sometimes I need silence because I just need my brain needs a break. But sometimes I really love background music without words. Like I can't do writing when there are words in the music. Uh, how about for you? What kind of background noise works for you? Please put it in the chat. Um, staying on a routine, getting good sleep, that's fantastic. And Erica, you need complete silence. All right, so we want to figure out what helps you concentrate and then set up the situation for that to occur. Uh, Tanya, you use an app called Relax Melodies. It has built-in timer for chunking. Ooh, I like that. That sounds great. I'm even writing it down for myself. Thank you. Um, Letta, let's see. Ooh, whoops. Hold on, a few came in at the same time. Tiffany, Kayla, it took me a long time to separate home and work and it helped distractions. Work is work no matter what. Okay. Letta, anyone else struggle with wanting to take a nap throughout the day? And yes, bodily do body doubling works wonders for my friend and I. We do it over the phone when we can't be together in person. We call it the silent companionship. That's wonderful. Monique, I need a quiet place to work. My father has a bad habit of needing to have the television on. Oh, so that, that makes it hard for you to work at home. Is there a library you can go to, a cafe? Where's another place that you could do work? Kelly, nature sounds, no voices. And Marlene says, always find a, work, found a, find a work buddy helpful. Great. So what's the second strategy? Organizing your workplace. Um, so when, you're, when we're talking about organizing your workplace, it's much easier when you know that everything has a, has a place and what those places are. So clutter is another distraction that can get in the way of you doing your best. So it can be tough to sort through piles, and there may be many of them. So lots of people with ADHD just avoid organizing altogether. So what I want you to try to do is to create some places with files, basket, ba boxes, or baskets, and label them with names, such as to do urgent, or to do important but not urgent, interesting for later, or unsure. So that you, know, you can have a place to store things, 
so they're not in your field of vision because when they're in your field of vision it starts to it starts to um, uh, you know crowd actually your ability to to think and to pay attention and this includes what's in your field of vision on your computer as well um, uh, you know, when you want to go through those different files, you know, make a time where you're going to go through the your urgent and important but not urgent files. The unsure could be something for a rainy day. Um, you don't need to do that right now. Um, some folks make it a habit to clean up at the end of the workday so you have a clean space uh, to begin the following day. Um, maybe it's a little pre-work routine where you have your coffee and you put things in those piles or those files. I prefer files to piles. Um, and you'll feel more calm and grounded when you work. Let's see, we have a bunch of um, comments here. Um, Mesha says, YouTube has lofi music videos. It just shows a person studying. Okay. Andrea, I focus best when I have more tasks. I'm constantly asking my boss for little extra jobs as switching attention means I give 100% for 10 minutes rather than 5% for two hours of boredom. She now calls me her PA. I'm not. So again, you know, what I appreciate you're saying, Andrea, is that you have insight into what makes sense for you as a worker and what's going to maximize your, per, your productivity and your performance. And that's what's important. Like if you can work all out for 10 minutes and then you need a break and then you can work all out again for 10 minutes, that's fantastic. Leah, uh, we Le, Leta, excuse me. We call each other accountability buddies. Oh, I like that. That's lovely. Accountability buddies. Hmm. Um, Catherine, how to prioritize and not move from them is the hardest thing. That's why I value the structure of project management. You have external motivation of project milestones and monitoring mechanisms to keep you on task. Terrific. That's such a positive approach to recognizing how you work. I work like that, but I've always seen it as a flaw. Okay. Um, Bob says, music with words can be okay, but not words I can understand. So not English. Okay. Also, music with more structure like Bach helps me keep my thought structured. Interesting. Thank you, Bob. Tiffany says, clean space is, was so helpful. My brain was so much more calm. Yes, but clean spaces only last a short while. So for people for whom clean spaces are, are we really last a little bit, we want you to have some routine before you leave your desk that you're going to budget in 10 or 15 minutes to put things in those files so when you come the next day, at least you're starting from, ground, from neutral. You know, you're starting uh, uh, from a place uh, where you can exhale and 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 really you know sort of ease into your work rather than feeling overwhelmed the minute you sit down at your desk mesha i have to do a tornado clean cleanup routine every hour to prevent overstimulation of the environment well, good for you for knowing that. I'm curious how much time you allocate to do your tornado cleanup routine um, because other people might want to try that and see if it works. Now the next thing that we want to think about is chunking your time. So time management isn't easy to master, but you can help yourself along the way. Uh, when it comes to being punctual, of course, setting alarms and notifications can be a lifesaver. But you need to set those alarms and notifications not right in front of you only. So you can have something like a you know Pomodoro method or a tomato timer or uh, uh, I think there's something called like rescue time or an app like that that sends notifications you can have those but you might need to take your phone and move it to a place where you have to get up uh, to hear the to, to turn off the timer uh, if you have your own office if you're in a cubby that may not be possible for you but you could certainly um, make sure there are a couple of loud notifications that are of, the, of sounds you find disturbing so you can actually do something about them um, uh, well, punctuality, of course, is important. Delivering your work on time it really a necess it, you know, sort of, um, is a necessity for a professional success. Um, so use these calendars and timelines to map out your work. And if you struggle with figuring out how to break down a project and map out your work, 
ask for someone to assist you. Um, maybe it's a colleague, maybe it's someone in human resources, uh, maybe you've hired a coach. Get the help that you need to break things down so that you can make your time work better for you. Thank you, Attitude, for that, those time hacks. I appreciate it. Because ideally what we want to feel is um, a sense of accomplishment along the way. That's really important. So let's see. Uh, um, Claire says, procrastination when I know what the priority is seems to be a huge challenge for me. Any suggestions? Yes, and that's a great, that's a, a really great question to ask. The, um, the, the antidote for procrastination is chunking, is breaking things down into small pieces. We procrastinate on projects for a number of different reasons. Perfectionism, we want it to be a certain way, we're not sure if we can make it that way, so we're not going to do it um, uh, at all, we're not going to try. Or perfectionism motivates us to get started, but, um, because it's, but prevents us from actually completing it or turning it in because it's not exactly the way we thought it should be. There's avoidance procrastination, which is when we just really just stay away from the task. The task seems really big. We don't know where to get started or how to get started, so we just avoid it altogether. And then there's productive procrastination, which is um, when we do other things that need to get done instead of the thing that actually needs to get done. And, um, and a lot of us uh, are a mix of those, or we may lean toward one or the other. So um, if you'd put up in the chat what kind of procrastinator you are, I'm sure uh, it would be fun for us to be able to offer support to each other. I'm a little bit of a perfectionist, but mostly a productive procrastinator. So um, my kitchen will look really good when, when I have like a, a presentation that's hard for me to get started on. Um, let's see, any comments? We have some comments here. Um, uh, uh, we semi, a semi, a semi hot desk, so we have to clean it up. We aren't guaranteed the same desk the next day, which is probably a good thing. Wow, that's intense. Um, I also have a friend who goes through my back backpack weekly. Wow, that's very nice. Um, when you volunteer or work with others, you never know what you're going to get. That's true. Um, it's Kate, my, uh, let's see, chunking equals pacing. Yes, I think Kelly, chunky can equal pacing um, because you are able to say, I'm, I can do this piece you know, in approximately this much time, and then I'm gonna earn myself a little break, and I'm gonna leave myself a note about what I was working on so when I come back I can think about it. Um, or you can, um, you can sort of uh, give yourself, um, m maybe not, maybe just um, say I can do this for 20 minutes, and then I'm gonna pivot to something else to keep my interest for another 20 minutes, and then go back to the first thing, then go back to the second thing, and then take your break. You know, whatever works for you in terms of your being able to maintain and sustain your attention and um, motivation. Kate says, my supervisor puts my allocated tasks into a spreadsheet each morning and puts them in order of priority, so I just work through them in order. Kate, that is the most incredible thing I think I've heard <laughs> today. I can't believe that, and I'm so happy for you that your supervisor does that. I wish more supervisors did that. That's a really great supervisor. I agree, Andrea. Catherine, um, uh, productive procrastination is a great description for my reality, right? And so when we're productive procrastinators, and, and I'm one of them, I really have to say I can do one thing for this amount of time only. I set my timer, and when the timer goes off, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go over to my desk. And when we go over to our desks, what we want to ask ourselves is, do I want to take on the hard project right away while I'm motivated and my, my brain is kind of clear? Or do I want to do something easy that will get me started and then I'll move to something harder? You have to decide for yourself how you want to pace yourself at work and with what tasks. 
Catherine, I've started a work log with my manager. It is useful if I'm disciplined to maintain it. Yeah, and you know, you might want to keep that work log small so you feel like you're actually checking things off because if the work log has 10 tasks and you only get to one for a day because it's a very complicated task then at the end of the day you're going to feel bad about yourself that there's still nine left tomorrow so we might want to take make a task list and then break that down into a smaller list that's more achievable um, Marlene had to redo my second year of university twice because I couldn't bring myself to hand my finished essays in mm. and then didn't go to exams as I felt I had failed everything that's a lot to put on yourself Marlene um, it sounds like you actually moved on from your second year of university and I hope you got support both mental health and ADHD support during that time um, that that feeling of failure that goes along with um, that having perfectionism can be very debilitating for people Claire yes I have some overwhelming work to do and then I avoid it as it is fr as it frightens me I'm also very good at being busy doing everything else except the tough pressing job I hear you about that um, so you want to do you might be someone who wants to put the hard thing first since you know you know you'll you'll continue to avoid it by doing other things it might help you to take that hard thing break it down at least start it and then be able to come back to it hi Susan let's see uh, Kate, Andrea Mitchell, Marshall, excuse me, it was one of the reasonable adjustments we agreed to after my diagnosis. Fantastic. Mesha, I'm a perfectionist that gets burned out planning events, but once I get going on an event, it turns out perfect. Wonderful. Catherine, but I find when I get focused, I can lose hours. Yes, and this is this hyper focus, which we've talked about before here, is 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 both a gift and a little bit of a detriment because when we hyper focus, uh, what happens is we don't break our con we don't break our concentration. We don't get up to go to the bathroom or get a drink of water or get something to eat, and we don't allow our brain time to integrate things that we're thinking about. So it's important to set a limit on your hyper focusing and you know I would suggest an hour and a half maximum um, because you really need to give yourself some, some your brain some time to integrate what you've done and you know so that a new idea will, will pop up I don't know how many of you have ever you know been working really hard on something and then oh my gosh I got to take a shower to get to dinner with my friend and while you're in the shower you get a fantastic idea so we, that, that's, um, that's part of, of the issue. And then the other part of the issue is because we're using our energy to think, the glucose centers of our brain become more and more depleted when we hyperfocus. And so people become actually more tired and then they're just running on um, adrenaline or cortisol. And that's not healthy for you either. Uh, did you get to ask quest did you ask questions to get reassurance I'd love to hear some other I'd love to hear other suggested reasonable accommodations okay so uh, we'll get to that in a second uh, Kate's know more of this if it takes five minutes of their time to help you work the best way then it's more than worth their time investment agreed I completely agree um, let's see uh, Letta Boone, I can offer some. Great. Uh, I'm, I'm Kelly Boone, excuse me. Um, please put those in the chat for us. Mesha, yes. Uh, Letta, sounds like my bestie. As I was leaving her house today, she insisted on building her new desk chair rather than working on the project she needed to wrap up today. Mm hmm. Uh, five minute break from my desk every hour which I booked into my diary although I'm not as good as I should be at sticking to it my managers have accepted that I will be able to complete a lower number of tasks per day than my neurotypical colleagues great there are some documents out there recommended for adjustments with ADHD and I believe attitude has a number of articles about that that would be helpful where are the documents um, uh, Kelly it was so many years ago I don't even think about ADHD then I didn't uh, so just I didn't ask for any help at all I finally sought some fought, sought some help when I went to college to do a different course a few years later and the same thing happened mm. Marlene um, I really hope that you can get uh, find someone to talk to about this because I'm sure your work is better than you think it is 
All right, so um, we, we have talked a little bit about the importance of buddies. Um, you know, finding a friend at work is both um, is, is both emotionally rewarding and it can be helpful. Um, if you find yourself confused or frustrated or in need of support, having a buddy to turn to is invaluable. And they can help you figure out a difficult problem or explain something maybe you missed in a meeting or just offer you encouragement to keep going on a task that's difficult. Um, work friends can also be body doubles. Um, and, um, and having a close colleague who understands your challenges will also offer you, you know, a sense of feeling seen and, um, and validated in, your, in some of your challenges. And lastly, I think it's really important to take the time to recognize that you work extra hard with ADHD to push forward and persevere despite the executive functioning challenges that you face. So celebrate your strengths and progress, even if you don't accomplish a goal, but you're doing it in a different way so that you are um, noticing your, your efforting as well as your accomplishments. Um, maybe take the time at the end of the day to reflect on three things that went well and keep a little journal about that, um, something you've learned or accomplished. Uh, when you, then you can go back and reread them and those will give you some hints about what to do in the future when you're faced in, a, a, in, a, in similar situations. Today I did, I used this tool, it was helpful. Today I used this tool, it was not helpful. Um, progress is what we're looking for here, not perfection. So let's go back to the chat and see what we've got here. Um, Andrea, my main written work is, to, is a report after six weeks with, subsection, with six subsections. I do a section at a time to 80% completion. It's enough if I run out of time, but if I have time at the end, I can add more to perfect it 100%. Accepting good and finished is better than perfect, but incomplete is a big lesson. Thank you for saying that, Andrea. I really love that. I think accepting good and finished is, is better than perfect, so much better, um, and even sometimes good enough. Um, Kelly says, me too. I'm great alone, but I struggle in groups. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Thank you for the articles. Um, all right. So before we close, I'm wondering, um, somebody asked for uh, certain kinds of reasonable uh, accommodations. So I'm wondering if you could put in the chat some things that you think have helped you at work. What are some reasonable accommodations that have helped you? Um, I, I think, you know, some of the ways of having uh, supervisors break tasks down or provide you with a task list is an excellent tool and a way to assist people. People um, who struggle with ADHD at work. Um, I'm cur I think having you know uh, timers. Um, I particularly love the time timer um, because um, it's better for me than the Pomodoro method because I like to work for an hour. I don't want to work for 20 minutes. But if you like to work for 20 minutes, the Pomodoro method could work for you. Um, uh, I also use alarms and alerts, and I have my notifications that are obnoxious so that I actually listen to them um, and I use them. Um, I think the other thing is to remember to kind of do what, um, I'm looking, sorry, to do, uh, um, ah, I can't find it. Uh, it's because, um, it's because Facebook got rid of it, is to take some time to, um, to be able to, um, really think about your work life rather than just show up for it. You know, really think about, well, what would help you? Um, uh, sorry, that is not the right link um, to help you. Um, there you go. Thank you. Uh, that should be the right link. Uh, let me just check. Um, uh, for you to help you with planning and prioritizing skills, that is the right link. That's great. Um, so and what we want you to do is to take a minute right now, let's take a minute right now, everybody together, and think about one thing that would help you work more effectively. And write it in the chat. 
What's something that would help you work more effectively? Salil says, working remotely has helped a lot. I always struggled with getting up, getting ready, commuting, and getting to work on time. Fantastic. What else has helped you perform more, uh, perform better at work and produce work that you feel proud of? Please put that in the chat. I think it's important that we share the things that we do that are working because we want to do more of what works and less of what doesn't. And sharing it publicly allows us to um, gain support but also to validate ourselves. Um, a John that is geared to my needs. I'm not sure what that means. So Kelly, could you try that again, please? Again, what helps you be productive at work? Because we want to do more of it. Um, thank you for the link to the time timer. Um, you know, does anyone have any suggestions of things that really help them? Andrea, mine is more one-to-ones with my manager to check in and let off steam. They've ended up being a mutual exchange these days, which I love. Acceptance, I need timeouts to regulate after overstimulation, plus giving me mini tasks to dopamine boost in the middle of bigger tasks. The, this is so fantastic, the insight that you have about yourself, Andrea, as a worker. I just, I'm, I'm really impressed. Um, not being geared to what the, uh, the job, not being geared to what the company needs. So, um, and I wanna uh, applaud all of you for your insight about what would help you work better as well. So, um, to get a job that actually meets your needs and the company's needs, or to work with a supervisor to make accommodations to your job so that it better suits you and you can meet the company's needs. Mesha says, accountability appointments with my counselor or supervisor, great. Time frame goals, time frame goals can be a lifesaver. I, um, I think it's really important to be able to set those goals for yourself. So thank you so much for attending today. Uh, in the chat are a lot of great um, handouts from Attitude and one from me as well on planning and prioritizing. Um, Catherine says external accountability is stressful but effective. Right, and so maybe what you wanna do when you're asking for external accountability for one thing because sometimes people who are neurotypical will tell you several things and you can only absorb one at a time. Key, I love this, to do and to be lists. I could definitely make a few to be lists myself. Thank you everybody. Um, uh, and I love Andrea saying, you know, a good job is the start. Don't suffer in a rubbish workplace. You deserve better. I couldn't agree more. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and I'll see you at our next Facebook Live, uh, which I believe is, let me check my calendar because we meet every two weeks. So I believe the next Facebook Live is on May 19th. See you then. Bye.